What's up YouTube and welcome to a new video. Now with a naturally aspirated V8, the Lexus LC500 certainly stands out from the crowd. The market analysis which I showed you last year did then also reveal that values are spot on. In this video we will figure out how much price has changed and how this compares to the competition. It wouldn't be the first time that prices for the last naturally aspirated V8 go through the roof. At least, I don't think that we will see a new naturally aspirated V8 anytime soon. Also, I know that it are usually the Porsche market analysis which get the most view on this channel, but I know that there is a smaller group of viewers who appreciate these niche markets. If that's you, let me know down below in the comment section which other niche cars deserve to be featured on the channel. All right, so how will we do this? We will first have a look at the current market so we know what's what. After that, we will look at the price development during last year and figure out if the market appreciates that this might be one of the last naturally aspirated V8s. Finally, we compare all of these numbers to some of the competitors like the California, 911 and F-Type. Over here we have the US LC500 market of December and you can see that I split the graph by the coupes and the cabriolets. You can also see that the market size is quite reasonable. There are 280 cars for sale, 167 coupes and 129 convertibles. And this includes the V8s and the hybrids. You can also see that the convertibles are a lot newer. They are then also more expensive and have a median price of $112,000 versus $85,000 for the coupes. We can also see that there are some cars which are priced above MSRP. I spec'd one up in the configurator and I couldn't really get it above $120,000. Perhaps these cars over here are bespoke builds, as I couldn't find any good reason as to why they are priced so high. Last year we could see that there were some inspiration series which were priced for extreme prices, but those premiums disappeared now. If we quickly split the graph by trim level, we can see that we have the inspiration series now in red. You can see that they are indeed rare, but that they don't sell per definition for a premium. So this might be a typical case where rare doesn't equal valuable. If we look then at the lower end of the market, we can see that prices start at $73,000. Yes, $73,000. That's quite a good value for money proposition. Naturally, you can also see that the premium between the model years decreases when the cars get older. So we are now up to date on today's market. We saw that there's a big price difference between the coupe and the convertibles and that there's a handful of cars which is priced above MSRP. Yet, we also saw that prices already start at $73,000. But the big question is of course, how did all of this change during last year? Let's have a look at the development of the median price point with the following graph and figure out if prices went to the moon like they did for some other cars. Over here we can see that prices between December 2020 and December 2021 increased with 9%. Yet, this is also an excellent example of how numbers can trick you. Today's market is namely not the same as the market one year ago. The market composition changed, as the number of convertibles more than doubled, while the number of coupes decreased with 15%. And since the convertibles are more expensive than the coupes, this is not really a fair price comparison. So let's split the market by roof type. Over here we have now in blue the development for the convertibles, and in orange the one for the coupes. And we can see something very special. Almost nothing happened. Convertibles literally didn't move and coupes saw a very small price increase. And this contrasts to what we can see in the rest of the used car market. You are probably aware that used car prices increased a lot during last year. In the market analysis videos on this channel, I showed that there are large differences between the models when it comes to the increased severity. Yet, most cars increased between 10 and 50%. Only the R8 V10 performance saw a small price decrease. So in the grand scheme of things, no increase at all for the LC500 is a bit strange. However, its result is not necessarily disappointing. There is more to this than meets the eye. But before we dive into that, if you like this video, please support the channel by clicking on the like button down below. Thank you. You can by the way also follow me on Instagram, it's at 4 Now then, let's first dive into the Cabriolet market and then into the Coupe market. You see, the Cabriolet market mainly consists out of new cars with zero miles driven. Over here we can see the market characteristics for this market. We can see that the median mileage and median model year didn't change, but that supply increased a lot from 50 to 129 cars. Now given this increase in supply and the relatively low demand for the LC500, it's not so strange that prices didn't increase. I mean, it's a nice car, but it's no GT3 which is fetching insane premiums at the moment. Yet, if you are an owner, don't worry, the market held up really well. Over here we have the mileage to price relationship for the convertibles. In blue we have the cars one year ago and in orange the cars in today's market. And this reveals that the new convertibles roughly go for $105,000 to $115,000 depending on the spec level. 
You can also see that between last year and now, there are a lot more cars for sale which actually have some mileage. And most importantly, that up until roughly 5,000 miles, the cars didn't come down in value. So this means that if you bought a car one year ago, at it roughly 5,000 miles, the value of your car hardly decreased. At least if you don't take into account any below margin on your trade-in. All right, so what about the coupes then? Well, values actually increased, but we need to dive a little bit deeper into the data to find it. You see, on an aggregate level, prices didn't move, but the older cars actually went up in value by quite a bit. If we start with the following plot, I think you get quite a good understanding of what happened in the market. Over here we have the model year to price relationship for the coupes. In orange we have today's market and in blue last year's market. We can see now very good that prices hardly changed for cars of model year 2021 and 2020, but that they increased for cars of model year 2019 and 2018. So this means that for the newer cars, the depreciation effect and the used car price increase effect cancelled out resulting in a zero price change. For the older cars however, the depreciation effect is less strong as they already took the first hit. So over there we can see that prices moved with the used car market trend. And this is not because the median mileage changed for the older cars. If we look at this price change from a mileage perspective we can see exactly what happened. Over here we have the median price development, median model year development and supply development for the coupe market but split by mileage bucket. The blue line for example shows that prices hardly decreased for cars between 0 and 8,500 miles. The orange and green line however show that for the higher mileage cars, so the ones above 8,500 miles, prices increased with an average of 12%. So all in all this means that the newer cars couldn't fully escape the depreciation effect whereas the older ones could. After all, the older the cars, the lower the effect. It also means that the price change for the 2018 cars is quite a bit different from the 6% drop which I forecasted last year. That forecast was based on last year's depreciation curve and we learned this year that those curves turned out to be useless as the complete used car market shifted up. And with that, let's do a little summary of what we just saw. We saw that convertible prices remain stable and that this means that you could have added a few miles to your car without losing any value. For the coupes we saw that the same thing goes for the low mileage cars. The higher mileage cars however saw a price increase of around 12% as the depreciation effect is not so strong anymore for those cars. But now then, if you're in the market for an LC500, you're probably wondering how all of this compares to some of its competitors. Yet, before we dive into all of that, let's first figure out how the LC500 is positioned in terms of price point. I namely think it's positioned extremely well. If you read on the various forums, you will find that many people are doubting between an LC500 or a 911. And you also find that some people are considering the California. Yet, I thought it also makes a lot of sense to include the F-Type over here. You can see now that we have the model year to price relationship for the California, the California T, the 911 991 Carrera S, the F-Type SVR, R, S, P450 and LC500. Now first of all, we can see that the new prices for an LC500 line up almost perfectly with the one of an F-Type R. Yet, when we look at the older cars, we can see that the LC500 loses its value less quickly when it ages. A 2018 LC500 is around $8,000 more expensive than an F-Type R. So I guess this is really where the reliability reputation helps the Lexus. I already pointed out in my previous LC500 video that the depreciation rate on these cars is very low. And it really shows here. It's not just compared to the F-Type, but also compared to the other cars that the LC500 loses relatively little. Now if we forget about the depreciation rate for a moment and look at the absolute price point, then we can see that the LC500 is one of the cheapest cars in the plot. A new one is just as expensive as a 911 Carrera S from 2015 to 2017 or one of the cheapest Californias, which is more than 10 years old now. Only the P450 is significantly cheaper, but I think that the difference for two equally spec cars is relatively small. You can see that the high spec P450s are in the same range as the LC500 coupes. So to sum it up, I think that in terms of residuals and an absolute price point, the LC500 makes a lot of sense. There are of course some other cars which could have been included here, like the Aston Martin DB11 and the Mercedes-Benz AMG GT. But I don't have up-to-date data for those cars, so I will include those comparison when I make new market updates for those cars. Now there's still one more thing which I would like to show you before we wrap up. And that's the price development for the competitors. Over here we have a lot of lines, but please stay with me. We have from top to bottom the California, the LC500, the 991S, the F-Type SVR, R and S. 
Unfortunately, as you can see, I don't have the exact same dates for the cars, but I think that this will do for now. And by the way, working on a solution where all of these data points are updated all of the time, but more about that in a different video. A visual inspection of this graph clearly shows that the California stands out from the rest. The Californias increased with 23% during last year, and that's not a bad result for this type of car. It's at least a lot more than I anticipated. If we look a bit further down, we can also see that the Carrera S has the upper hand on the LC500, but that this difference is perhaps smaller than one could have expected. The LC500 market increased with 10% on an aggregate level, but this is driven by the slightly older cars. The 991 Carrera S on the other hand increased with 13% between the beginning of this year and August of this year. So it's likely that the increase of the full year will be higher than for the LC500. The Jaguars on the other hand saw a flat price development, with exception of the S models. Those saw an increase of 11% in the first 9 months of this year. So based on all of this, I think we can conclude that the value development for the LC500 is aligned with its competitors. It's not the best performing car, but certainly also not the worst performing car. So from that perspective, the market just followed the trend. It didn't see a large price surge because it's the last naturally aspirated V8. And with that, let's wrap up and conclude. We started with a market overview and saw that the market is clearly divided between the coupes and the convertibles. After this we had a look at the price development over time and this reveals that it are only the older high mileage cars which saw a price increase of around 12%. The rest of the market saw a stable price development. We then continued by comparing the LC500 market to the one of the 911, F-Type and California market. And we saw that the LC500 is positioned very well in terms of price point and also that Lexus's reputation might be the reason for its strong residuals, especially when compared to the F-Type. Finally, we also compared the price development over time, and this showed us that in the grand scheme of things, LC500 values moved in line with the market. They increased less than the Californias, but more than the F-Types. I therefore still think that the LC500 offers a tremendous package, which is difficult to ignore at this price point. There are however many articles online, which highlight it as a future classic. This of course might well be the case, as it has some special features, where the naturally aspirated V8 is the highlight. And this must count for something, right? You are probably aware what happened and is happening to 458 values. A car which is also a last of its kind type of car. Over here you can by the way check out the full market analysis for the 458 market. Yet none of this hype is currently visible in the LC500 market. And with that we arrived at the end of this video. Now if you enjoy this data driven way of analyzing car markets but would have liked to see the analysis for a different car, let me know down below in the comment section for which car you would like to see an analysis. Once there are enough requests for a certain car, I will make a video about it. Also don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell so you get actually notified when your requested analysis goes live. As always thank you for watching and I hope to see you next week for a new video.